Put your hand up if you've ever received a sales phone call to your cell phone. Has Vodafone ever called you? <laughs> has, has Orange ever called you? Um, did you buy anything from them? Why not? It was cold. It was cold, right? It was, it was like irrelevant. It was unnecessary. It was annoying, wrong right? Timing. Yeah, it was wrong timing. It was like, hello, who is this? Why are you calling me right now? I'm at work, you know? I, um, that's, that's, that's happened to all of us, right? What about when you go to a website and you're trying to read an article and like a pop-up comes up and takes over the whole screen? You know, like what do you guys think about that? Like, is that like really annoying? You know, like, okay, click exit, you know, or you know, these, these kind of um, uh, spam emails you get. You know, companies will just like blast you. Like, I don't remember subscribing to this, you know. So um, this has happened to all of us, okay? We've all kind of been there where we were getting unsolicited sales, like cold, direct sales marketing. Um, this is how we're still, this is how we're still selling and marketing to our, to our targets, right? We're still doing these, these bad business practices, right? These like cold, uh, cold calls, direct mails. You know, you ever go to, um, who's been to like Caprabo or, or, uh, or um, what's the other one, like uh, Mercadona, and you check out, and they give you like all these receipts and all these coupons, and you're like, what, what is all this paper, you know? It's like unsolicited. It's, it's kind of unnecessary. It's ca catching you kind of off guard. You go to your mailbox, and you get all these weird random mailers, um, or you see ads and emails at the wrong time. So we still market our business like it's in the 1990s, okay? We're still kind of pushing our, our idea um, on people who aren't ready and, and they're, they're not really receptive to our ads. I think it's estimated that um, we get hit by 3,000 or 4,000 ads per day. 4,000 ads per day. We don't know that because we've, we've automatically trained ourselves to ignore those ads, okay? We've, we've basically subconsciously erased and do not see all the billboards and bus ads and TV ads and commercials and radio ads and, and things on your phone and things that you just swipe away. But like 3,000 times a day, we're getting obliterated by these things. But people have translated and we haven't, we haven't adapted to how we actually handle our marketing business. Um, it used to be that generating and lead nurturing was just a part of your strategy, but now it's, it's basically everything, okay? Taking your person down the customer funnel that is an, that's your entire content marketing strategy now. The idea here is that most of the people who come to your website, come to your, your mobile app or whatever it is you're trying to convert them on, they're not ready to buy yet, okay? They're just not there, okay? They're window shopping, they're just gathering information, they're kind of just doing a, a, a first check or a second check or evaluating their options. They're not ready to convert. So we can't go with a hard close most of the time. We need to think about kind of, um, building a relationship with these people, and we can do that through content marketing. Okay, so um, there's a million ways you can define content marketing. You can, you know, we can sit here and, and do a whiteboard session and come up with like a definition of what we think content marketing is, but more or less, the, the definition that I like is basically the, the idea of creating rele relevant and valuable information with the idea of building relationship and building trust, okay? We're not doing this to try and hard sell and close somebody. The idea is that we want to find out who our target audience is, find out what their needs and problems and challenges are, and then develop the, the content, the information that will help them solve those problems. And we do that, when we do that, we start building trust, we start building relationships. So this is usually the definition I use with my, with my classes, with my students. Um, but we can get into the nitty gritty of like what's inbound marketing versus what's content marketing. Does anybody have any other definition they, they like for inbound or for content? Does anybody think that inbound and content are different? Yes, Mar, what are, what are the differences? I think inbound um, includes much more things than content marketing. Okay. Like, so you think inbound's the big circle yes. and inside there's content? Yes. Okay, does everybody agree? Yeah. You, there's no right or wrong here, I've heard both. In fact, I actually tend to think that content's the big circle and inbound's a, a small portion of content. Um, in, in, in that point of view, it's like content marketing 
can encapsulate all sorts of different marketing you know, activities, even employment marketing, branding, you know, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel, we'll get into some of these things. And inbound is more attracting new audience members. So it's just for that, like that first inbound pull of somebody who was a stranger and now came to us. Come on in. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, I don't get too, too focused on the definitions, but the idea is add value, right? The idea is create interesting, relevant content. And feel free to, to grab a seat or grab a beer before you, before you come if you want. Um, you guys know the different types of content we can make, right? Everybody here kind of familiar with content, kind of familiar with, with these items, have made them before, have been involved in companies that have made these types of, of materials before, blog articles, ebooks, webinars, events, videos, all these different kinds of pieces of content we can create. These are all kind of included in content marketing. But that's content marketing today, in 2016, right? Content marketing's been around for a long time, right? Who knows this? Le guide du Michelin. <laughs> What's the Michelin guide? Right, right. So you guys know when, like, if a restaurant has a Michelin star, is that good or bad? It's good. It's like, well, that's a really good restaurant. It's Michelin star, right? It's a, it's like a Michelin star chef or a Michelin star restaurant. So um, the Michelin guide started when? When when did it first come out? <laughs> Actually, I think a little bit before this. I think it came out like in 18, 15, 1895 or something like that. Um, this was genius. Does anybody know why Michelin guide came out? What does Michelin make? To make the tire better. It was to make people travel more and so on. Right. So Michelin, what business does a tire company have rating restaurants? What, where, where, where is that connection? Why would a tire company talk about restaurants or hotels? The idea with the Michelin Guide was to give Parisians an, a, a, an interest in restaurants that were like 200 kilometers away from downtown Paris. So they would drive their cars really far and use out their tires so they have to buy more tires. Okay? Uh, Michelin Guide got, got famous on its own because they actually were a very good guide. They gave very good advice and good, good uh, information on, on restaurants and stuff. Come on in. Take a seat. <laughs> and... Um, they were so good that it spun off, and now the Michelin is a huge franchise. It's a huge, huge brand name now. I mean, restaurants kill themselves to, be, to get a Michelin star. I mean, that's like, that can make or break your career as a chef if you're a Michelin star chef or you worked under a Michelin star restaurant. So now it's its own thing, but it started as a way to sell tires. You know, I always think it's the funniest story, but that's content marketing. That's content marketing 130 years ago, you know? So it's, uh, it's not new. It, this one is a little less known, but who knows the, um, the brand John Deere? What do they do? They make farming, tractors, Agroptima. Agroptima, you have to know John Deere now. So John Deere is a brand that makes tractors and farming equipment, right? They've been doing it for 200 years. It's an old, old, it's one of America's oldest brands. Well, in the 18, like, 70s or 80s, they developed a newspaper called The Furrow. Okay, I think this is maybe one of the first ones. This came out in the 50s. But The Furrow was a basically printed newsletter that came out, like, in... 1875 or something, and it helped local farmers produce more crops, have a better harvest, just best practices in farming, okay, tips, and it was produced by John Deere. Now, John Deere gave this away for free. They would, they would sell some advertising in there, but for the most part, what this did was position John Deere as a, as a leader in agriculture, as a leader in farming equipment. So when these farmers who would take these great tips, these great best practices in, in their agriculture, would then have to you know, replace their tractor after 10 years or something, they were more willing, more, more, more likely to choose John Deere as a brand because they had that trust with that brand. And the furrow is still around. They still produce it. It's a quarterly magazine. It comes out every three months. So this is a 130-year-old content marketing example. You know? So content marketing is not new. It's just now it's accessible to all of us with, with the advent of the internet. Um, more or less... Every company is doing this. B2B, B2C, everyone is putting marketing budget towards content marketing for the most part. Okay? The, the 9 out of 10 B2B companies are investing and reinvesting and investing more every year into content marketing. So here are 10 reasons why our companies should also do content marketing. Whoa. Number one, credibility and expertise. 
Um, one of the things that I always have to explain to clients and, and everybody I talk to um, is that content marketing is more about showing off your knowledge and trying to help people than trying to close a sale, okay? Uh, my clients sometimes tend to think that this is how content marketing works. Okay, they're gonna read this great blog article on my website. Then they're gonna be so inspired by that blog article, they're gonna come to and they're gonna buy you know, $200 worth of product on my website and they'll be a client forever. That's content marketing, right? It's, it doesn't really work like that. A blog article w will not usually create a new customer, okay? It's not, it's not guy reads blog article, guy makes purchase, you know, happily ever after. It's about building trust and credibility, positioning your brand as an expert. So um, the idea here is to, to really try to create insightful and valuable content that's, that's resonating with who you want to build trust and a relationship with. Um, and really it's about potential clients, especially inbound. If we're talking about like top of funnel, the first impression, we want to try and to attract new people and build trust with them, build a relationship with them. Uh, there's a company in the United States called Home Depot. Does anybody know Home Depot? Building supplies, it's a huge mega warehouse. You walk in, it sells anything and everything possible for home improvement. Well, about, I don't know, seven, eight, 10 years ago, Home, Improve, home, uh, home Depot started a inbound content marketing campaign where they just did how-to videos. How to build a birdhouse, how to paint your deck, how to install a roof over your garage, how to uh, you know, tar your driveway, how to rake leaves better, or whatever it might be, but it's all how to. So people started using this as a resource, right? So every, every few days, Home Depot was publishing more content because people when hey, I need, to, I need to buy a new mailbox, like how do I install a mailbox, or how do I do this? They're Googling that, right? So if the answer is you, and you're the one producing this content, they're much more likely to trust Home Depot because Home Depot told them exactly how to build it. Hey, by the way, after this video, I'm gonna give you a checklist of all the things you need to buy for this project. Come to Home Depot, we'll give you a 10% discount. You know, there's a lot of ways to, to turn that into an actual um, profitable exchange because they're known as the experts. Home Depot did, has done a tremendous job with their content. The other one is brand awareness and visibility. Okay, increasing the footprint and the reach of your brand. Who remembers um, the Stratos, Red Bull Stratos? What was it? Uh, the air pollution went off, and then the guy just, I, I forgot his name, yeah? Just off. Felix. Felix. Felix something. Uh, Baumgartner or something like that. Yeah. Um, has everybody, everybody seen this? Yeah. This is a tremendous video. 2012, they put this crazy skydiver in a spacesuit, and they put him in a balloon, and this was sponsored by Red Bull and GoPro, and they put him up pretty much... I don't know, 40,000 meters in, in almost into outer space, like to the, to the top of the atmosphere. And then he jumped out. And GoPro did all the, 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 video, the videography, the, film, the filming, and Red Bull sponsored the entire event. And with the help of probably a couple of the brands, they did one of the most memorable content marketing campaigns ever on the face of the earth. And it, it worked, it was, it was worldwide. Almost everybody knows this campaign. You know, and this is, you know, this is about four or five years ago now, but this is still probably one of the most, you know, biggest impact splash campaigns ever by a brand doing content marketing. So the idea here is the more engaging, the more relevant, you know, your content is to your target audience. Obviously, Red Bull and GoPro kind of going after the extreme freestyle, you know, adventurous type of person. The more traffic you're going to get, the more customers you're going to get, the more of a brand you're going to help create and the more audience you're gonna help create around your brand. And of course, more money. Um, it's cheaper. So who here works or has worked in a startup? Oh, almost all of us, okay. So obviously we care about our budget and our costs. We need to do a lot with a little, okay? That's, that's every startup's job, right? Get as much value and impact from the smallest budget you need to spend, right? And, and uh, that's one of the things that that is so amazing about content marketing and inbound marketing is that with, you know, with some creativity and a small budget, you actually save, you can save a lot of money and have a huge impact uh, with, with your target audience. Um, Compost and Eloqua are two competitors to HubSpot. They're both um, marketing platforms, like marketing automation softwares. Uh, they came up, they basically did a study and they found that after month five or month six, um, the cost per lead 
of, of leads coming from your content marketing, your email marketing, is actually 80% less than if you're doing pay-per-click or you're doing some sort of paid advertising. So basically what that means is it's not turnkey as in you start content marketing and tomorrow you, you're famous, but over time you're building an asset versus spending it on advertising. You know, you're, you're creating a, a resource, a, a database, a, you know, you're creating a, something that's gonna keep adding value and keep getting stronger that, that in its, on its own, like the Michelin Guide, becomes its own piece of value, as opposed to kind of tossing it around the, down the drain with like CPC. Not down the drain, because cost per click and pay-per-click campaigns have, their, have their, their uses, but over time, you see diminishing returns with, with pay-per-click. Whereas with content marketing, the shelf life of these articles can be much, much longer. In HubSpot, you know, obviously they have a big stake in the game of inbound. They've actually kind of created this inbound um, uh, concept. Um, have basically said that, that your inbound marketing can be up to 60% cheaper or less expensive than if you're doing a, you know, a paid campaign. SEO, we all know search engine optimization, the value of creating links for Google to send traffic to you organically. Well, obviously good content marketing improves your SEO. This is becoming more and more important, especially the, the social element here. Um, search engines, Google's always updating their, their algorithms, right? So who knows, like the last one was uh, Panda, Penguin? Anybody know FDSC? Anybody follow the SEO? Google's always updating it, but we don't really know what Google's rating us on, right? It's kind of like the Coca-Cola recipe, like it's a secret. They don't, they don't let that out. We don't know exactly what their formula is, but we can kind of guess, and Google will tell you you know, more or less what they want to see from you to get ranked on the first page of search engine results. Well, part of it is producing good content consistently and regularly. So every week, every two weeks, make sure you're publishing a new content, but also that content needs to be constantly shared on social media. So Google, when they're comparing two sites, there, you know, there might be a site who hasn't updated their homepage or anything on their website since 2014 and hasn't shared anything versus a site that every week is publishing new content, new stories, new articles, new, new news, and then those articles are being shared on social media. Well, Google's weighing that more strongly than the, than the company that might have a really good product, but there's no fresh content. The site hasn't been updated. So um, SEO and content marketing kind of go hand in hand. Again, this is a long-term strategy. It's more of a marathon, not a sprint. It's not going to happen overnight, but after six months, 12 months of doing content marketing, you're going to see your natural organic leads increase simply because Google's ranking you higher. You're showing up in more search results. Building relationships and customer retention, again, this is more about creating a long-term relationship with your target audience, okay? We don't necessarily want them just to come in once by and never come back. We're trying to establish trust so we can get repeat visitors, client retention. A lot of companies work in SaaS, like a, you're optimized as a SaaS model. When we get them in as our customers, we don't want to lose them, okay? We actually want to try and upsell them, and we do that through, through trust and, and content marketing on different stages of the funnel. This is a company called Harry's. Harry's makes a shaving uh, brand. I don't know if you guys know Harry's. Um, they have a fantastic content marketing strategy. They have a, a, a website called Five O'Clock. Five O'Clock stands for the Five O'Clock Shadow. Like, at, if you shave in the morning, by Five O'Clock in the afternoon, you have a little bit of a shadow for guys. It's a shaving company, a razor company. Well, they have a whole blog, but how often do they talk about shaving on their blog? Very little. Because how much can you write about shaving, right? It's like, it's maybe like once a month there's an article of like how to better get a closer shave. But you can't write about that every day. Because no one would subscribe to a blog about shaving. It's, it's a really kind of boring thing to subscribe to. So what do they do? They look at who their target audience is. Okay, in this case, Harry's goes after a specific demographic of probably like upwardly mobile, upper, upper middle class males, ages 20 to 45, who are, you know, committed to good looks and self-grooming and good habits. Okay, well, what do those guys care about? Well, maybe they care about having a nice car. Maybe they care about, you know, buying nice things for their apartment, how to take a woman on a date, you know, how to, how to wear, a, how, to, how to get a, you know, an Italian suit fitted to your, your body type. You know, these kinds of things that those kind of people would care about. Well, all their, all their blog articles are always about these types of topics. Come on in. You know, so this is, this is what, this is basically what we're talking about. Is we don't want to talk about ourselves. We don't want to talk about our product or what we sell. We want to talk about what our audience cares about. 
We want to focus on them, what their problems are, what their needs are, and then develop a content strategy around that. Okay. Um, again, this is something that it, it, content marketing allows us to stay engaged with our audience well after they bought something. Like in Harry's case, we want them to buy the razors from us, but then in six months, they're gonna need more razors. Well, if they subscribe to five o'clock or they're on our newsletter or they're following us on social media, we have a constant channel where we're always providing fresh updates, we're always providing relevant information for our target audience. They're gonna stay engaged with us and they're much more likely to, to be a return and repeat the, the customer with us. Who's ever seen like, something like this before? This is an example, of, like, we call it the customer journey or the buyer's, the buyer's journey, the, customer funnel, there's a million kind of names for this, but, and every company's different, right? Whether you're B2B or you're B2C or uh, you're B2B2C or you're peer-to-peer, -peer, every company kind of has different um, chapters in the story of a sale, right? It starts with like, okay, how did they first find us? Well, maybe in the first, you know, the acquisition phase, maybe they came from Twitter, maybe they came from LinkedIn. Somebody shared a post and they followed it, they came back to our blog, they read the blog article, then they subscribed to a newsletter, right? Now they're in our now they're in our wheelhouse. Now we touch them every, every week, every month with our newsletters. And now we start kind of nurturing them down the funnel to where they're basically converting into, into paying clients. And so, at, like I said, every company is gonna look, every company will have a different version of this, but this is more or less the customer journey. They start as strangers, they get first introduced to our brand, we convert them into customers, okay? And then we, th these are things like viral loops. I don't know if you guys know like what a viral loop is. The idea where, where a sale can actually bring in one or two or more e other sales. These are things like referral programs. Who knows Typeform here? Nice, Typeform is a great company. Well, what does Typeform do when you finish filling out a survey? What is type, what's the thing that, that Typeform says? Make your own, Make your own Typeform. That's, that's called a viral loop. Basically, everybody who fills out a Typeform survey gets a call to action to make their own Typeform. Like, well. That's a genius, genius marketing strategy built into their product. Um, engaged customers, you can upsell, you can cross-sell, you can repeat sell, you know, you can offer them other products in your catalog because they're already, they're already kind of talking to you, trust engaged with you, you know. It's so much more valuable and cheaper and cost-effective and smarter to upsell an existing customer and to retain an existing customer than to go out and pay to get new ones. So startup people, we know like the cost of acquisition, you know, the cost of acquisition is a huge metric that investors look at, is how much does it cost you to get one new client? And if that cost is more than, than the profit you're making, well, you don't really have a good business plan. So we wanna, really wanna focus on making sure we don't lose customers to churn. You know, we wanna retain all of our existing customers. So these are, you know, like I said, it, it differs for everything, but at every stage of the funnel, we have to produce different content. So the, the content that brought them to us in the first place is very different than the content that brought them to actually put their credit card information on the website and make the purchase. So we need to kind of think about w at what stage in the buying, buying cycle are they and what should we be showing them. So this is very simple, broken down, tofu, mofu, and bofu. Top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel, okay? At the top of the funnel, these people are, are, you know, like I said, window shoppers. They don't know you yet, they don't trust you yet, but they do have a need that you might fill, okay? What kind of content are we showing them there? And how do we kind of nurture them down to it's like, okay, now I know that I need this, but why you? Why should I buy it from your company? Well, maybe at that stage of the funnel, maybe you're showing like testimonials and case studies and success stories, where up here, it's more broad general content, you know? five ways to, to save money on your gas, you know, maybe brought them to your website. But down here is, you know, why, why go with my, my tire, my tire brand versus another, you know? And as we get down to the bottom, maybe there's a call to action with a discount or, or some, sort of, uh, some sort of referral program that's gonna, that's gonna make them actually put their credit card information down. So it's like, why should I buy right now? That, might, that, that kind of content might be a little bit different than when they're first, not ready to buy. And this is more. Again, this will be different per company, but at the top of the funnel, we're doing things like blog articles, videos, um, you know, success stories, how-tos, and as we move down, we're getting more specific with the content that's gonna try and actually get them to convert and become a customer. And then at the bottom, 
How do we keep them loyal? How do we keep them engaged with us? Do we do a members only newsletter? They feel exclusive, they feel like they're part of a club that, that you can't get into unless, you buy, unless you're actually a, a paying customer of this client. These are things that they might like get special access to, special discounts or annual promotions, stuff like that, to keep them engaged, to keep them around. Because a lot of times, if you're not in a subscription model, it's hard to kind of stay engaged with somebody who bought from you because they bought it, they, they, have, they don't really have a need for you anymore, but how do we actually keep them to, to stay engaged and also bring their friends and family along too? Okay, stay relevant. Um, how are these guys still relevant? Because <laughs> they keep changing their, their style. They keep staying relevant to every new generation. The Stones still sell out every concert, okay? They have been relevant for like 40 or 50 years playing, playing concerts. Um, that's not an easy feat, okay? So we need, to, we need to be consistent and we need to be creative. This is where consistency matters. This is where we need to get into more of the factory approach. We need to start thinking like, um, like a media company, okay? How do, we, how do we stay relevant? How do we stay sustainable, okay? Uh, you can be really good at content marketing one time or two times, but how do we do it over and over and over again? And how do we get into a rhythm? So we, like I said, we need to work like a media company. We need to think like who knows um, Vice? We need to think like Vice. We need to act like we're a big media company. Even though we're a small startup, we need to act like we're a publisher. We need to be bigger than we look, or we need to look bigger than we are. Um, we need a team, okay, that develops content, is on social media, is, is doing press and PR and communication, is, you know, is focusing on email and lead nurturing. You know? This needs to be kind of a holistic approach because we need to act as if we are the New York Times. And in order to do that, we need a team. And this is where we kind of start thinking about the factory approach. Okay? The biggest mistake, I think I have a slide for this. The biggest mistake that I see companies make, startups and, and otherwise, is that they hire a content marketing person. I've seen it all the time. Who's, who works at a company or who knows a company that has hired a content marketing person? <laughs> that has hired one content marketing person. <laughs> it's, it's hard, right? It's like you hire one person, you put them in charge of all this, it's too much for one person, okay? They will get burnt out, they will get sick of it, they will, they will run out of ideas in six months, they, they will quit. They, we've seen it over and over and over again. It's not, you don't hire a 25 year old you know, intern and say, hey, you're our content marketing guy, go get him. You know? This is a team effort. This is, a, this is a collaborative approach. You need to be inspired by multiple people within the organization. Everybody in the organization can add value to the content marketing strategy. This is sales. Sales is probably one of the most important members of the content marketing team. Because why? Because sales talks to the customers. They, every day they're on the phone with the customers. What are your problems? How do we help you? How do we solve your problems? They have the perfect inspiration for the whole content marketing calendar because they, they're close to the market. Um, it's a team sport. Obviously, maybe this maybe is what it looks like at you know, a small business or a startup or something like that, but um, we can draw inspiration from different people within the organization, and that way it's not all on one person to come up with ideas every week. You know, because that, that person will quit. So um, there was a company here, they got sold, but they were a company called Zincro. Who knows Zincro? Zincro? It was like um, kind of like a team box, kind of like a, a red booth, kind of like um, Yammer. It was like an a internal social media network, like an intranet for your, for your company, right? And um, it was founded by a, a cattle entrepreneur, Luis Font. And he had one of the best content marketing strategies I've ever seen. Basically, he made it mandatory that every single person in the company, and there was like 35 people in the company or more, every single person in the company had to come up with one blog article per month, okay? So not that hard, right? Like if your boss says, hey, once a month you have to write an article. You're like, all right, I could, I could probably do that. Like, but when you have 35, 40, 50, 60 people doing that, well, guess what? You have at least an article per day. You know, so that blog was always full, and so you would have developers, you'd have HR, you'd have sales, you'd have marketing, you'd have, you know, everybody in the company writing, and you'd get this great big picture of like not only what they do all day, but what it's like to work there, 
what they care about. And they didn't always have to write about work. They could write about you know, where they went on a cycling trip over the weekend. Or, you know, but they had to create. They had to create content. And that was one of the best things. That company ended up selling for $30 million. You know? And it's a 30-person company. So pretty good return you know, on a, on a four or five year uh, company growth. Um, but uh, but it, the, the big thing is, is they didn't put it on one group or one department. It wasn't like, okay, you two, your social media, your content, go. You know? No, this has to be a team growth from the bottom kind of activity from the, whole, from the whole company. And a lot of it is just staying organized. Um, this is kind of like a very simple breakdown of keeping your objectives at the very center. What are my goals with my short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals? And then how do we reach those goals through systems and processes, okay? So on one side, we have what is it we're actually going to create to reach our goals? What content? What is, what, what is our editorial calendar? What are the needs and wants and desires and, and problems and challenges our customers face? The other one is the structure. How are we going to actually publish it? Are we going to use WordPress? Are we going to use HubSpot? Are we going to use social media? What social media? Are we going to use Buffer or Hootsuite? Are we going to use, you know, which channels will we use? What's the actual, the kind of content component versus the people? Who does what and when? Okay, so this side is we need to know who's in charge of the workflow and when this, when this builds this, you know, who gets it next. Um, and then lastly is who's governing over the, the entire thing. So we have like, uh-oh, what do you think? It's changing it on this one now. Huh, it's only changing on this one. <laughs> Maybe we do. Should I unplug it and plug it again? Yeah. Whoop. Oopsie. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> Fine. Thanks for your patience. Basically, the, the idea is that um, we, need, we need to be organized, and we need to, we need to know who's accountable for what, and, and then stay on time. And the easiest way to do that is through like an editorial calendar. So who's, who's actually working in content marketing now? There you are. You are. Do you guys use an editorial calendar? What do you guys use? Well, I'm using um, Google Docs. Yeah, Google Drive. That's the, that's the simplest one, right? Like, just set up an Excel sheet, Excel, Google Excel grid of the topic, the date we're going to publish, the notes, you know, who has to be involved, who's going to write it, who's going to proofread it, who's going to edit it, who's going to publish it, who's going to share it on social media, and just have those roles outlined. And, and, you know, it takes a while, but as you get into it, yeah, perfect. Um, sorry, yeah, I spilled the beer, too. No, um, but this is, yeah, just a very simple, you know, workflow. Okay, article one created on this date. Who gets it next? And it kind of goes down this kind of workflow so we know that who's publishing, you know, when and where. This is a very simple example of an of a editorial calendar, just an Excel grid, right? Who's doing what? What's our topic? Who's it assigned to? What, ha what still has to be done? Um, Repackaged and re-merchandised. And, and I can send out this deck to anybody who wants it afterwards. Um, you know, and it just kind of breaks it down by category. I, I can email you guys the, uh, the, the PDF. Um, but it's important here just to stay organized. Uh, who knows Sephora? Makeup. Sephora has 100 professional writers. I know that because my friend is a professional writer in San Francisco for Sephora. 100 of them, 100, and she's a journalist. She's like, she's like an actual, she used to work for the, you know, like the San Francisco Gazette or something. She's like, she's a, she's a journalist, and they hired her along with 99 other writers to produce content for, for Sephora, which is a, a makeup brand, a very popular makeup brand. You can, you can imagine that gets messy very, very quickly. You know, 100 different writers, you gotta think about how many blogs they have, how many topics they cover, how many target audiences and groups and campaigns and seasonal product launches and all the shit that they do. Think about Sephora's product line. I mean, it could fill, it could fill this room, all the different products they sell. So this, this gets very messy very quickly in a large organization. And the more content marketing becomes more important as far as your, your sales and marketing channels, the more you keep, bigger companies are putting more and more resources into this. And we'll see a couple examples later. But she's like, it's, it's crazy. It operates like a newsroom. It's like you're, it, it feels like you're working at the New York Times, but you're, you're, she's a marketer. Okay, this is what we were talking about at the beginning. This is all the ads we see and ignore. This is obviously not Barcelona, 
But um, we're focusing a lot, we're hearing a lot lately about content shock. Has anybody heard this phrase before? What's content shock? You get penalized for the, all the content. Yeah. Like we, w there's so much content, there's not enough eyeballs to see it, right? There, it, it, content shock, I pulled this off the internet. Um, content shock is essentially brands are creating more content than there are humans to read that content or see or watch or view or share that content. So it's like we've reached this point of critical mass. We've gone too far, that, you know, and now we're actually we can go a little bit even further. There's artificial intelligence bots that are writing articles now. So like if, if your job is to dra draft articles, it's slowly getting replaced by robots. So the, the idea is that we're reaching this point where just talking, just publishing 400 word articles for SEO isn't a strategy anymore. It's not working, it's being ignored. However, that doesn't mean that content marketing is dead, it just means we need to be very careful of our, of our approach. Um, the solution to content marketing shock or content shock is focusing on your audience. Because if you know who your audience is and you know what their problems are and you know, you know where they are in your customer journey, you can create the content they're looking for. And you can do the research. However, content marketing is becoming a much more expensive game because we need to, we need to do that much more research, that much more preparation and planning and, and due diligence into every piece of content we create. Like I said, those 500 word articles don't cut it anymore. Now, 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 word articles are the norm. Okay, Google's starting to rank those higher than anything else. So we need to start developing really, really important content. We were talking about a company that's doing it well is Typeform. They just launched their content, content marketing campaign a year ago, but it's very good. They don't publish very often, but when they do, they have something to say. And it's, it's almost like that article was so good, it took them a month to create it, you know, because they had to do research, they had to get all this information, they get it all in the right place. But that's kind of where it is, is just is focus on your audience and you won't, you'll still add value, you'll still get through to your audiences if you're creating it for them. And last but not least, um, keep improving, keep measuring, keep practicing, keep experimenting, okay? Zuckerberg, fail fast, break things, okay? Let's just get it done, let's try it, let's see how it goes. Always be testing, always be improving. Um, we're seeing big, big companies that are turning into media organizations. So who knows Intel? What does Intel make? Chips. Has anybody ever bought anything from Intel directly? Then why would they do content marketing? Why would a company that, that you've never, and they, you can't, like, you, you can't go into a store and buy Intel. You have to buy a product that has Intel inside of it, but you can't buy Intel. So why does Intel try to reach you? Like why does Intel have commercials? Why do they do content marketing? Why do they have, this is a blog called IQ. It's a, it's a, it's a basically a media platform that shares all these technology stories. It's technology and, and culture. And, um, but why would they do that? Why would they want to reach an, an audience that is never going never gonna to open their wallet for Intel? So you know the, the brand? But at the end, you, you need to decide between Intel and AMD. Right. Because when you're at, when you're at FNAC or you're at you know, you know, a, a media market or something and you have two computers in your hands and one says Intel inside and one doesn't, you're more likely to buy the one with Intel inside because you know that brand, you trust that brand. That brand's inside of you, you know? They used to have this campaign in the United States that was their, their ding. Ding, 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 ding. Remember that one, like the Intel ding? And that was their commercials, you know? But it, I always thought it was so funny. Why would that company make commercials? I mean, spend millions and millions of dollars on, on advertising and marketing campaigns, and I'm never gonna be, I can't physically, I can't go buy Intel. You can buy products with Intel, and that's, that's the thing is they wanna create a relationship with you. And who knows, down the line, they may go B2C. I think they have had a couple forays into B2C too. Now we're seeing things like Intel um, Edison, if any makers are in here, like uh, Edison is kind of like a, a modified like Raspberry Pi, right? Um, so they are doing some B2C work, but they have a relationship with you and you trust that brand, right? How do we feel about Intel? Like, do we like Intel? Yeah, like I, I feel like Intel's like, yeah, they're, they're probably best at, at what they do. Um, so yeah, we see Intel doing it. Companies like GE, General Electric, doing it too. Um, this is Marriott Traveler, Marriott the Hotels. In spring of 2015, about a year and a half ago, Marriott started, they, they did a $100 million investment in the content marketing. A $100 million investment. They hired a whole staff. They launched this website called Marriott Traveler. They did a mobile app. 
they create content five times a day, and it's all these kind of stories about traveling. You know, what to do in Orlando, Florida, bewitched in Boston, Halloween fall activities to give you a fright, you know, these kind of travel things. They never talk about their hotels. It's all about what you can do when you're staying at their hotels. It's all about the cities. It's all about the, the vacations, the trips, the things. These are good for kids. Oh, these are good for honeymoon trips, these kinds of things. It's, in, it's inherent in their marketing that you'll stay at a Marriott, you know, because they're, they're adding value about this location. Oh, by the way, it's just around the corner from our honeymoon suite in Barcelona. Um, so uh, Marriott did a, did a fantastic uh, launch, and they've already come out with like, some metrics and case studies about proving that this investment's already starting to have a return. Um, this is what it looks like behind the scenes of Marriott. This is their office, their content marketing office. What does it look like? It looks like a newsroom. It looks like, it looks like they're like on BBC or something, right? I mean, think about that. This is Marriott, Marriott Live. Why would a hotel brand have a news agency? You know, but that's where this is going. That's where the big brands are heading. They're, do, they're spending millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars to become news agencies. Because why spend millions on PR and marketing to try and get New York Times or Vice or Vox or, or BBC to cover your hotel when you can just create a news agency yourself. And with, and with, with de, the internet, it's democratizing the opportunity where we as brands, as startups, we can create newsrooms. We can create media ourselves. We don't need to, I mean, obviously PR still helps. As a tech startup, if you get your name in, in TechCrunch, it's huge. But while you're trying to do that, you can be publishing yourself. And you can start creating your own media platform. And so we're seeing brands opening these new, like this isn't, this isn't on the marriott.com homepage where you book a hotel. This is its own entity. It's its own brand, Traveler. It's its own thing. I mean, you don't even really see Marriott on here, do you? Here, one thing, book a room. Everything else, couples and family, culture and style, eat and drink, health and fitness, tips and trends and places. Matt, you wouldn't even know this is Marriott unless someone told you, right? But yeah, there is a call to action. You can book a room. This is one that came out about, I think about five, 10 years ago. This was called um, um, the Dove's um, Real Beauty Campaign. Does anyone remember this? This was like a huge, huge success because they basically made their, their customers the, 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 main, the main hero of the story, right? They put real women, real people on stage or in their ads, and they made them uh, part, of, part of this huge campaign of like, this is what a real woman is like, you know? And this, this sold a lot of product, a lot of soap. <laughs> um, but there was a yeah, huge thing, very, very viral, very, very organic and, and, uh, and customer focused. This is Red Bull. You guys all know Red Bull. Red Bull does not sell soft drinks. That's a very small portion of their business. They are a media company. They have the Red Bulletin, they have all these platforms, they do all these events, they have these crazy sky shows where the planes come in and fly. I mean, they are a full-on lifestyle media company first, a publishing company first. Yes, they sell the Red Bull drink, but they make a lot of money just through their, their publishing on its own. They publish a lot of, uh, of targeted content towards that um, athletic, adventurous, freestyle extreme audience. Uh, Coca-Cola. If you go to coca-cola.com right now, it redirects you to coca-colacompany.com. Coca-colacompany.com is now Journeys. So Coca-Cola has completely gone away with their homepage, away from like, you know, Coca-Cola's been here since 1899 and we do this, like all the company info. No, no, no. You go there now, it takes you to a thing called Journeys. And it's all the different content Coca-Cola is producing. Coca-Cola is another company that's spending hundreds of millions of dollars on content. And these companies are becoming, like I said, media companies. And they're producing so much content. And they go even beyond. They do like experiential marketing. Does anybody know what like, experiential marketing is? Experiential marketing is like when actually like a marketing campaign goes into the real world and you actually interact with the brand in one way or another. You'll see it with like um, um, movie launches and stuff like that. Or like, you know, like the World Cup or the Olympics. There'll be a lot of like experiential marketing things. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of examples. Like what you, uh, who went to Sonar? 
sonar, you go into sonar, and, and there's like this thing where you can do like a selfie picture, and you get dressed up, or you do all these crazy things. Like it's like you're you're actually interacting with the brand, and then you can actually tweet it out directly from an iPad right there. That's like experiential marketing. There was one for when James Bond came out, the new Bond movie came out this year. They partnered with, um, I think it was Sprite or something, and it was like. The, it was like the Bond challenge, and it, the next, like, guy went up to a, a machine, and he, and he you know, uh, can be, uh, what's that called, a vending machine, he went to buy a Sprite, and when he did it, it was like, you have 60 seconds to make it to Platform 2 at the train station, and he's like running, and then there's like all these obstacles, he has to jump over the obstacles, and it was this big kind of viral event, but it, it got like, you know, 700 million hits on, uh, on YouTube and stuff, so it's, um, you know, these things, these things are getting very, very creative, but, but it, it allows, when you have an audience, it allows you to do some really, really unique uh, things with content. So I tend to think that the future of content marketing is moving in a way that marketing will actually be product development kind of in one. Um, there's a company called Crew, and Crew does mobile apps. They make mobile apps. Uh, they did a, a content marketing campaign called uh, how much to make an app.com. Has anybody ever seen this? How much to make an app.com. You can go to it. How much to make an app.com. Get started. It takes you, walks you through a series of questions about, the, about your idea for a mobile app. Okay, do you want your mobile app on Android, iOS, or both? Click both. Okay, do you want it to be um, beautiful uh, or does it have to be more functional? Okay, I want it to be beautiful. Okay. Uh, do you need to be able to log in and make a profile? Yes. Uh, can you use Facebook? No. You, know, you need to you answer all these questions. And at the end, it's a calculator. It tells you, okay, based on your answers, your mobile app is going to cost $65,000 or something like that. And then it says, would you like to speak to a designer? <laughs> you know? And so it's like, well, of course. It makes it so easy. Like, oh, okay. I, like, oh, that, that my app was only cost $25,000. Oh yeah, I will talk to a designer, and it connects you right away to a developer, a web app developer. So it's like it's like their funnel, right? It's their top of funnel because people guess what they're searching for when they, when they have an idea for an app. When they, what do they Google? How much to make my app? <laughs> That's what they're googling, and they're coming to this website because it's number one on the search results on Google. And then they're putting in their information. It's kind of fun to pick your choices of what you want in your app and how nice it's going to be. And then at the end, let's talk to a designer, right? Let's start. And and this is where I think we're moving with content marketing. I think we're moving to an area where marketing and product development will kind of be one and the same. And we will be building our marketing into our products and we'll be building products for marketing. Like this is a product. This is a, this is a web application that they had to develop and build, but, but it's also content. So I think, again, content shock means that content marketing is, that's, that's standard now. Okay, you have to have a content. That's like not even an option anymore. But now you need to go a step further. And you need to get design is taking over the world. Okay, we need well-designed, well, well, well thought out pieces of content, valuable, valuable um, articles, webinars, videos. Video is, is everything. Uh, who here is doing video at their company? Who here is companies doing video? Sinja's doing video. Daniel, you're doing video? For, for which one? No, but your company is. Yeah, yeah. Is the Wave is or they were doing video, yeah. and they're doing YouTube, Facebook, or okay. It's just a preference of because video can be shared on lots of different platforms, right? It can be shared on Instagram, which is how long? Sixty seconds, I think. Videos on Instagram. I think Vine is six seconds. Um, YouTube can be as long as you want. So can Facebook, but Facebook recommends you stay under a minute. You know, um, YouTube, you have to watch. Half, somebody has to watch half the video for you to get credit for that view. Um, so you have to think about who my audience is, what platform I'm going to use, what kind of content I'm going to create. The, you know, big brands, um, they can't just produce a TV commercial and spend $5 million on a TV commercial with you know, Matthew McConaughey or something and then say, okay, that's a good commercial. Let's also put it on Facebook, on YouTube, on this, 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 and this. Because um, on Facebook, it's a much different... Uh, viewing experience than on your, when you're on your sofa watching TV, right? When you're on your sofa and you see a commercial, you can't really do much. Unless you have TiVo and you can fast forward it or you can leave the room, you have to sit there and watch it. Like, you have no option. You have to watch that commercial. But on Facebook, what can you do? You can skip it. <laughs> like, nope, nope, nope. You know, they call it thumb stopping. You need, you need a video that is going to stop their thumb in the first three seconds of your video. 
and you have to do it without sound. Because when you watch videos on Facebook, there's no sound unless you activate the sound. So there's this whole strategy for, for Facebook video. Uh, Sanjay, I might need you again. Yeah. Um, there's this whole strategy for Facebook video, which is completely different than YouTube video, or completely different than TV, right? You need to think about who our audience is and how are we gonna actually repurpose and reshape and recycle that video content for, uh, for Facebook, or for YouTube, or for Vine, or for Instagram. Because the, the audience is different. The way they interact with the mobile app, the way they interact on, on, on desktop is gonna be different depending on the platform. And video, the, the um, we had a guest speaker at AOTA this year, and, and uh, uh, he's the head of video for EMEA, for Facebook. And he's based out of Dubai. And he said, by 2019, like 85% of all internet traffic will be video. And it already is like 40, 50% of all internet traffic is video. That's insane. So we are moving, moving much towards video. So th the future of content marketing is also video. It doesn't mean there's not a place for written content. People still need you know, written content, but we need to start moving into video. And that's gonna be a, a huge, uh, huge uh, market in the future. So, <coughs> recap. Content marketing is not to close the sale right away, usually. It's about building relationships, building trust, increasing your brand awareness, doing it because it can be more cost effective in the long run. You're actually building your investing rather than your spending, okay? It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an investment, it's an asset creation rather than a, a cost center. You can improve your SEO, that's happening naturally, it's a byproduct. Um, you're trying to develop a long-term customer relationship for repeat purchases, for, for retention. You're staying relevant. Through content marketing, when we're doing this research, when, when we're asking our salespeople, hey, what do you, our customers need? What are they asking about? We're staying very close to the market. It helps us innovate. It helps us develop our product roadmap because we know that what we research for our content marketing will help us develop version two or version three of our product. Or no, hey, we need to move into this space. Our, our market's changing. We need to go after this market. Um, it also keeps you very close to your competitors. Um, there's no I in team. This has to be, this is not a one person job. This is a whole team effort. Ideally, the entire company has, a, has some relationship with the content marketing strategy in the company. Um, very important to implement re repeatable systems and processes. So it's, it's not a chaos. It's structured. We know there's a system. If someone quits or gets fired or we hire new people, they can fall into the system. We don't have to like, you know, train them all from scratch. There's a manual. There's a, the way, th way we do things. Um, focusing on your audience and their needs is the sure way to avoid content shock. You'll always be able to develop value. And then lastly, measure. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So you have to be able to measure it using HubSpot, Google Analytics, whatever it might be. Make sure you're, you're getting an, an ROI on your, uh, on your content. And that's it for me. <laughs>